So in part three, I already introduced the uh, concepts here dealing with um, after deterioration, we either dissolve the relationship or we go through and repair that. We talked about the reasons why we dissolve as we go into dissolution and then the reasons why we decide to go through and maybe repair. I'll get to that stage here in just a second. Let's talk about dissolution, relational dissolution. Uh, and this uh, this sucks for everybody, uh, regardless if you're the breaky or the breaker. Or, um, the, the problem with this is we think we failed. The failed relationship doesn't mean necessarily that you're a failure, because obviously it takes two people to go through and uh, and and reach an impasse in, in a relationship. The tough thing to do while we're dissolving or even post dissolve is maintaining uh, is to maintain our esteem, our our self worth or value, mainly because we've kind of banked that on somebody else. We've, we've given it to somebody else and have it uh, be their responsibility to make us happy. If you read uh, in The Mastery of Love, the man who didn't believe in love, you'll get better acquainted with that concept. And too many relationships are set up that way to where we feel we might be responsible for each other's happiness. So when we break up and we have nobody there to make us happy, we uh, have a tendency to, to tank uh, our own esteem. So it's important to surround ourselves with uh, nourishing people that we focus on tasks uh, that are at hand, uh, like everyday tasks, like getting out of bed <laughs> would be a good task to, you know, brushing your teeth and doing the dishes, um, maybe going to work and doing things that are expected of you there still. It's important to remember your successes that uh, at this point in your life, because you find yourself alone again, does not necessarily mean that you are, like I said before, a failure. That's hard to do. And like I said, on both sides, either if you're the breaky or the breaker, it's, uh, it's tough. And you, you find out who your friends are at this point, and those are the people that you want to hang around with for a while. Um, don't be afraid to um, accept their offerings of help, of companionship, you know, to go to a movie or have some dinner together, or whatever the case might be. The problem with dissolution is a lot of people um, don't uh, end the relationship there. They have a tendency maybe to go crawling back and uh, try to re-kickstart the relationship and go back to the contact stage. Um, lots of people do this, and obviously lots of people are relatively successful. Others make it even harder or worse, especially if there are children involved. Um, where nothing's changed, nobody's changed the uh, the addictive behavior, no one's changed the narcissism that might have led to the dissolution, no one's changed the communication behavior, no one's checked the barriers, it's still the same, and yet we feel that after we dissolve the situation, we're so lonely, so desperate, or so hard up for sex, that we go back and get in touch with that person again and try to relight the fire. And statistically, it's not a very successful venture, so I would uh, caution you. <laughs> not to do that. If you go the other way and decide to repair the relationship, um, that's a good idea. What we're introducing here is uh, the three F's of relational maintenance. The first F here, you might want to write this down because it's not going to show up, is fidelity. F-I-D-E-L-I-T-Y, fidelity, the first F of relational maintenance. And really, fidelity is our ability to go through and recognize what needs to happen within our relationship communicatively and then adjust or make reparations. So that could be an apology. It could be, uh, I'll try to change that behavior. Uh, it could be a, a recognition of one's own shortcomings, um, whatever the case might be. Also engaged here in the repair stage is everything we've been talking about over the course of the semester in terms of listening. How we listen. Do we need to be active or passive in our listening? Do we need to be non-judgmental? Do we need to be more empathic? Do we need to be critical? Do we recognize what's going on? Most of the repair that we do communicatively is in the listening stage. Okay. Likewise with perception. Uh, have we misperceived? You know, are we defaulting to assumptions? Are we taking things personally here as well? This all. This is a, a vocabulary of the repair stage. This is a conversation that needs to be happening. And once we feel we're ready to move on, then we strike out in this concept of fidelity. And we, we can go from repair then back into intimacy. Um, we can go from repair back into involvement. Uh, if, if the repair stage requires another level of testing or that we have to go through and rekindle that fire, 
then instead of going back into intimacy, we're going to go back into involvement, okay? And typically, there's some level of infidelity or some suspicion that gets us to that point that'll take us uh, back to involvement. We're not ready to go back into intimacy if there's that kind of that issue that's at stake in terms of uh, why we've deteriorated relationally. Or perhaps uh, after a long-term marriage that you've, uh, the, the two of you have fallen completely out of what you consider love to be. And we need to take it all the way back to the contact stage. I've done this. My first spouse and I went through this, uh, dealing with everything that we went through with our first son. Um, we got so wrapped up in his care and living at Primary Children's Hospital that uh, we lost track of our own relationship and we had to go back and we started over again, which we did. And then we moved back into involvement and back in, in, into intimacy. Well, the, the three Fs that I was talking about in terms of relational maintenance, fidelity is going that triangle, okay? Where we go from intimacy to deterioration, deterioration to repair, and then repair back into intimacy or maybe involvement or contact, okay? But typically it goes intimacy, deterioration, repair, intimacy, deterioration, repair. And we, we make that cycle almost like a, um, a ceiling fan, if you will. It's just, it's just rotating that way. And by definition, this is what's, this is fidelity. It's fidelity because it's functioning. Um, it's functioning at a level that sustains both parties involved here that way. We, we also understand that fidelity might have um, something to do with loyalty. Certainly that's the first definition of this, but fidelity also means functioning at a higher level. The second F to friendship is this concept of forgiveness. If we hold a grudge, if we... Uh, make it a point to maybe gather bullets for our gun so we can retaliate and have information that we can use against the other individual. Um, we're not going to go from the repair stage back in intimacy. We'll go from repair back into, de into deterioration. There's a reason why that arrow goes both ways. And then from deterioration, uh, if we can't rescue it, then we go down into dissolution with that. So forgiveness is a big deal, and yet most of us don't understand the concept of forgiveness. There's that idea out there that you forgive and forget, and you know, I don't believe in that. I don't think we're humanly capable of doing that. And for a good reason there. It's one thing to go through and forgive an individual of an infraction, but if they go through and uh, perpetuate that, uh, that infraction on you again, then uh, it moots the forgiveness. The, the, it wasn't there to begin with. There has to be some level of absolution to whatever that behavior was. And if we forget about it and we allow ourselves to be um, vulnerable on a level where we could be hurt again, then um, the forgiveness hasn't helped us out there. So it's, I think it's important to go through maybe index behavior. Forgive, certainly, um, but be careful in giving your heart back. The third F in the uh, three Fs of relational maintenance is this concept of friendship. That Storg love that we talked about when we were talking about the different loves uh, in under intimacy, Storg's pretty uh, powerful thing, and you know, very few couples, it seems, have that ability to love at that level. The no matter what level, no matter uh, I don't need to maintain it level, I don't need roses and, and cards, and uh, it's just there constantly. Or even better, uh, the agape level of love, where there are no conditions, there are no obligations. We take responsibility. We're always kind. That level of love then will go through and maintain a friendship. There's nothing really truly romantic about that idea. Um, like uh, Eros love or Ludus love, but it's, uh, it's enduring and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to maintain that level of friendship. But there's some, um, I've had a critique of this model. This isn't my model. This comes from DeVito and a number of other people who study uh, human communication in relationships. Um, I would like to go through and augment that a little bit and add one more stage to this. And I'm adding that stage up above contact, involvement, and intimacy. And I call that stage amelioration. This is a, a French word, amélioration, which means to improve. The problem that I have with the six circles or you know, the five circles is it's a closed loop. We might go from intimacy, deteriorate, and then go into repair and then decide everything's okay. We go back in intimacy, but we don't have any level of improving. It's a closed loop and we don't have the ability maybe to spiral upward. We just keep going around and around, if you will. So um, I'm introducing this concept of amelioration. I'm doing that here for 
a reason. I'm going to give you five different behaviors of amelioration in order for us to maybe lift this entire set of stages to the next level as we cycle back around again and prove things. A um, couple things we need to do with this idea of amelioration. Um, one is deals with ownership, and the other one deals with um, releasing things, what we're going to release. So the first things here is uh, the first things we need to own are our emotions. This isn't new to us. We've been talking about that uh, a lot this semester is in terms of owning how you feel. When you do that, then you have culpability. You have the responsibility. Nobody else can make you happy. Nobody else can make you angry. Nobody else can make you sad. You have that ownership. The only way you're going to go through and improve things is if you maintain that level of ownership of your heart, of what you feel. And while we all want to make somebody else happy and we all enjoy being made happy by somebody else, um, it really needs to boil down to we're taking ownership here for how we feel. We need to own what we say. We need to own our communication. We've determined also early in the semester that our word is who we are. What we speak, what we say represents us. If we are impeccable with that word, we take ownership of that as well. So that means there's a level of integrity. That means you follow through with what you're going to, you follow through with what you say. That means you have a, a, a consistency of character in your day-to-day -day activities. So the person who loves you more than anybody else can depend on you and can trust that emotion with you that way. Lastly, here in terms of ownership, we need to own our direction. And this might sound a little selfish to a lot of people out there who are very self-sacrificing, um, but it's important because if we end up abandoning our direction, whatever way we want to go for the sake of a relationship, there will come a time in your life when you will regret abandoning your own direction. So perhaps in finding somebody you want to spend the rest of your life with that uh, becomes part of the criteria that you are in ownership of your direction and that they are in ownership of their direction. That's uh, one thing I was fortunate to get very clear with my spouse right from the beginning. And as a result of our ownership, we've been able to go through and be incredibly supportive of each other in what it is that we want to do. We haven't had to sacrifice or give up anything. Uh, and it took us a, a, a couple of marriages to go through and understand that we have that ability. It's okay to own what it is that you want to do and where it is that you want to take your life. We have the ability to cross that over with each other. So from ownership then, we'll get into what we're releasing. And the first thing you need to release, and this will hopefully come as no surprise to you after we've talked about this, is your expectations. We're all going to have them at some level. I think um, as much as I uh, teach and admire and respect Don Miguel Ruiz, um, I think it's impossible for us to let go of expectations altogether. And, and maybe there ought to be some level of expectations like integrity and honesty, uh, communication, those types of things involved in a relationship. But there are those extraneous expectations. There are those uh, unrealistic beliefs and undefinable expectations that we've carried with us, either from our family, from uh, the influences of our culture, our church, from the media, whatever the case might be. Uh, and we're surrounded by that. It's fodder, you know, in music, in, in uh, film, in, uh, oh, is anybody reading any books anymore? We're surrounded by these, these ideas, these expectations, and uh, they're, they're not going to work. For us, So we need to let them go. We let go of the expectations. We have uh, higher levels of surprise and we have lower levels of disappointment in what's happening. Lastly, we need to release our past. We have a tendency to hold on to that a little, a little tightly, especially somebody else's past. If they've had a relationship with uh, another individual, we hold them to that. If we've had a relationship, we hold on to our conditioning of that relationship. If we want to truly go through and ameliorate the situation that we are in, we need to understand that uh, the past has nothing to do with the, uh, the, the present attempts at us trying to go through and improve things. These five ideas, what we're going to own and what we're releasing, culminate in an emotion that um, for many of us is very difficult to come by. And that's the emotion of gratitude. 
I often get asked, uh, people come into my office, students, after they take the class, and they'll say, well, I think I might be in love with somebody, but how do you know? How do you know if uh, you know this is the right one? And I have some issues with that. I don't believe in the right one. I think there are many people out there for many people. Um, I know that sounds entirely unromantic, but um, um, there's a lot more than just one opportunity that you have to be yourself and to be happy with yourself with another person. When I tell them uh, this response, they look at me kind of funny because um, I think we have higher expectations out of a relationship. I say, if you want to know if you are in the right relationship, it's what you feel in terms of gratitude. This is my son, Barrett. I've talked to you about him a little bit. This is him. Uh, and he's uh, in the hospital here uh, in an intensive care unit. He's getting better. He's suffering from a pneumonia. This was, um, gosh, shortly after his third birthday. And uh, we finally got out of the ICU. This was in St. George. And we went to my parents' house for uh, Christmas dinner. It was Christmas Eve, in fact, when we got out of the hospital. We didn't want to spend it in there. And we were kind of ho-hum around the uh, Christmas dinner, my parents and my spouse and my son. Uh, he had uh, five liters of oxygen blowing into his little nose that way in order to keep him saturated. And there was a knock at our door, at my parents' front door, and my father went in to answer it and opened it up, and there was uh, Santa Claus standing there in the door. And he was ho-ho-hoing himself, and he asked for Barrett Lee Young. He called him by name. I picked Bear up. I had him in my arms. I stood up, and I uh, walked into the front room, my wife following with his oxygen tank and his telemetry and all that stuff. And uh, sure enough, there was Santa Claus, and, and this was Barrett's real first experience with Santa Claus live that way. He knew about him, but he'd never seen him. Santa sat down in an overstuffed chair next to the Christmas tree, and he asked for me to set Barrett down on his lap, and I did. And Barrett's eyes were huge. You know, he's smiling, and he's happy getting away from the doldrums that we were experiencing for Christmas Eve. And that Santa Claus went on to pull out three different gifts out of his bag, each one gift-wrapped and with, his, with Barrett's name on it spelled correctly, B-E-R-R-E-T-T. -T. And as he opened up each one for this little guy, each gift was appropriate to Barrett's abilities because he couldn't move his hands or his arms like you and I do. But each toy was certainly thought out. A lot of thought went into um, what Santa decided to bring him that Christmas Eve. We stood back. And we watched this. And I turned to my dad and I said, who is this guy? Is he like your home teacher or something? And he's like, hell if I know. And my mother was just crying her eyes out. I guess that's where I get it from. When he was done with the gifts, he handed Barrett back over to his mom. And he stood up and he grabbed his empty sack. And he wished us all a Merry Christmas. And he left our house. And that feeling that I had there that night, that I have right now, in, in telling this story, is the same feeling of gratitude that I have for my companion. It's not sexy. It doesn't sell Valentine cards. It uh, You don't see it on the big screen. You don't see it on your Facebook page, you don't read about it. It's just pure and simple gratitude. And if we have the ability to ameliorate our relationships, to go through and own how we feel, to own our communication, to own our direction, and allow our companions to do the same thing, it's been my experience that this level of gratitude is the default response out of that. So that's it. These are the relational stages. I'm hoping out of everything that we've talked about here that you've come to realize that really all this boils down to just one pure and simple concept that we just learn how to love each other.